Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away tonight. What the end of the CERB program will mean for millions of Canadians. This might be the fall where they have to drop out of school because they don't have the money to go back. After quite a week for the Liberals, at issue is here. I think it starts at the top. What's at stake for Conservatives as they pick a new leader? Remember, all the money you give goes to building the wall. Another former Trump advisor faces criminal charges. And baseball lessons. Moments like this represent reminders that we haven't done all of the work. Will an on-air homophobic slur prompt real change? This is The Nation. After shuffling the cabinet and proroguing parliament, the Liberal government is keeping busy. Today, announcing new COVID-19 relief spending as the CERB program phases out and EI expands. Canadians will have access to an additional four weeks of CERB for a total of 28 weeks. We're going to make it easier for Canadians to get EI. The $37 billion plan includes three new aid programs. Of course, it all depends on the government surviving a confidence vote when Parliament resumes next month. So still lots of uncertainty for millions of Canadians who've relied on CERB benefits during the pandemic. Ashley Burke starts our coverage with a closer look at the details. It's been very, a very, very sad time. As a classical guitarist, Andrew Ma is used to not having a regular paycheck. But COVID dried up everything from his performances to teaching gigs to his side hustle as a sound engineer. Now the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which helped him pay the bills, is coming to an end soon. Before CERB, it was a uh, life of terror for uh, a while there. Um, I think now, at this point, it's, it's getting a little bit terrifying again. The government did provide more certainty today, announcing that most CERB recipients would migrate over to EI. We're doing our very best to support all Canadian workers and leave no one behind. The government also revealed three new temporary benefits for those who don't qualify for EI. Help for the self-employed and those in the gig economy. Paid sick leave for those who fall ill or who must self-isolate. And a child support subsidy for those forced to stay home with kids because their school or daycare is closed. At the beginning of this crisis, our government promised to do whatever it takes to support Canadian workers and to support Canadian businesses. That is what we're doing today. But the new programs are contingent on the government adopting a new bill. With Parliament prorogued, that can't happen until the end of September. By effectively proroguing Parliament and shutting down and locking down Parliament, we're unable to be able to have real discussions. I think once again they're putting Canadians in a difficult position not knowing what is going to be the case and where the money that pays their rent is going to be coming from. Ma's happy about the news. It means he could receive a $400 weekly benefit and start working again, but says without a start date, he's still stuck in limbo. And it's it's a little confusing on, you know, like how aggressively we can, like we, sh we, we need to be to when we start, you know, start trying to work again. All he wants is some certainty during such an uncertain time. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, for all the help that $37 billion can provide, some Canadians are wondering if these benefits will be enough, even if they get them. Carolyn Dunn has that part of the story. There's no denying that the Canada Emergency Response Benefit has helped millions of Canadians. Like so many others, university student Spencer Julian was watching hoping to hear a good news announcement about federal support. His CERB benefits are coming to an end soon and work in prospects cities, are sporadic um, cetera, at best. It's unfortunate that the government hasn't accepted the reality of many students that this might be the fall where they have to drop out of school because they don't have the money to go back. Artist Savannah Harvey has concerns about whether COVID-19 will outlast benefits she hopes she doesn't need to collect even though her maximum monthly support would drop by $400 a month, she's grateful to know it's there. I'm, I'm very fortunate. Uh, it does look like I'll be able to transition from the CERB program onto the recovery benefit program. So I do have that sort of plan B that I can fall back on. For months, the $2,000 monthly CERB check has been keeping millions of Canadians afloat. Now, enhanced DI and other benefits will be extended, even to people who don't normally qualify. 
an acknowledgement that the economy for un- and underemployed Canadians isn't near normal and won't be for some time. This employment recruiter is expecting a rush of job seekers as the CERB winds down. Her company is shifting part of its focus to help them figure it out. There's no doubt about it that people are going to be left in a pinch when this transition happens if they're not preparing for it already. A pinch for millions of Canadians just trying to get by. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. This was the final night of the Democratic National Convention, an all-virtual affair in this pandemic. And the central message to Americans was clear. You need to vote. We must be the heroes of our generation. Our votes can be our voice. But on night four, the big moment was saved for the end. Joe Biden accepting the Democratic Party's presidential nomination. Susan Ormiston is in Wilmington, Delaware, where Joe Biden spoke tonight. So, Susan, this major moment for Biden, this incredibly important speech, how do you do? Yeah, in 47 years of his political career, this was the night, Adrian, and he, many would say, met the moment in that he did what he was asked to do. He had a very inspiring speech. He said that Americans can and will do better. He asked them to banish the fear and darkness and go with hope and ingenuity. And he said that the basic character of people is really what's on this ballot. Character is on the ballot. Compassion is on the ballot. Decency, science, democracy, they're all on the ballot. Who we are as a nation, what we stand for, and most importantly, who we want to be, that's all on the ballot. And the choice could not be more clear. A little taste of it there, but, but really, how hard did he take on his opponent, Donald Trump? Well, you know, if you listen to carefully to what he just said, you know, that character is on the ballot. He's talking about the positive character of American people instead of the negative character that many people believe is Donald Trump. So for a long time, Democrats have been hammering, saying that, you know, Donald Trump is on the ballot. That's what has to be decided. But he flipped that. and He said, we can take that back. We can control that. He said that the present uh, president has failed the American people in one significant way, and that is to protect them. That coronavirus has killed hundreds of thousands in this country and that it has to be banished. So he went after Donald Trump for failing on that purpose. What we know about this president is if he's given four more years, he'll be what he's been for the last four years. President takes no responsibility, refuses to lead, blames others, cozies up to dictators and fans the flames of hate and division. Adrian, a lot of people were looking at, to see whether Joe Biden would uh, execute this speech flawlessly. He did. Whether he would appear strong in his conviction, he seemed to do that. And he also had some very tender moments where he talked about, of course, the personal loss in his family, losing his wife and daughter and then his son in the course of his lifetime. And he said something, he said, through pain and loss and grief, what he found is the best way is purpose. And he related that to all the Americans who've lost people to this horrible pandemic. So he sewed up all these ideas. People looked to him, he was firm. He was empathetic, which many people have said is part of his character. And I think Democrats would say that this was a very successful night that launches him into the 2020 campaign, which will be brutal and nasty. And there were lots of Trump supporters here with their trucks and uh, lots of banners tonight. So this really kicks off 2020 with the Republican convention starting next week, Adrian. And you can be sure that there will be some firing back from President Donald Trump, Adrian. All right, Susan Ormiston in Wilmington, Delaware tonight. Thanks, Susan. Build that wall. That was a recurring chant at the Republican convention back in 2016. Now, the president's one-time advisor is accused of using that idea to defraud people. As Paul Hunter tells us, Steve Bannon and three others allegedly pocketed hundreds of thousands of dollars donated to build the wall. The arrest came on board this massive multi-million dollar yacht off the coast of Connecticut. 
Hours later, a handcuffed Steve Bannon, former chief strategist to Donald Trump, pleaded not guilty to fraud and money laundering. Where's the money? Then released on $5 million bail. This entire fiasco to stop people who want to build the wall. Live on the U.S.-Mexico border in El Paso, Texas. It's the We Build the Wall Wallathon. The allegation against Bannon and three others involves millions of dollars raised ostensibly for a privately built wall on the U.S. Mexico border. It's meant to augment what President Trump and the government is doing. We got $100,000 just now. This is incredible. But authorities say the push for donations was a scam. Some fencing went up, but all kinds of money was hived off, they say, for jewelry and other luxuries, even cosmetic surgery. Remember, all the money you give goes to building the wall, goes to situations like this. On election night 2016, Bannon was in Trump's inner circle, on stage that night at Trump headquarters. A fixture in the president's early days in the White House, he was seen as a key factor in Trump's rise to power, later dismissed by Trump, though just last year, Donald Trump Jr. seemed all good with Bannon's wall project. This is private enterprise at its finest. I think it's a very sad thing for Mr. Bannon. I think it's uh, surprising. Said the president today, he's not dealt with Bannon in a long time. I know nothing about the project other than I didn't like when I read about it. I didn't like it. Bannon joins a lengthy list of former Trump insiders now indicted or convicted or in jail or facing jail on a variety of crimes. Trump has distanced himself from all of them. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Alexei Navalny has spent years fighting corruption in Russia. Well, tonight he is fighting for his life. The prominent opposition leader is in a coma after an apparent poisoning attack. Rene Filipponi takes us through what happened. In a video recorded by fellow passengers, Alexei Navalny can be heard moaning in pain. The plane made an emergency landing in Siberia. He was taken by ambulance to hospital. His supporters believe he was poisoned, drinking this cup of tea before boarding. Poison is being considered as one of the possible causes, says the deputy chief doctor at the hospital. But there are many other possible conditions. A spokesperson for Navalny says he's being transferred to another clinic. It's unclear where. The Kremlin says doctors are doing all they can and wish him a speedy recovery. Navalny is known for exposing corruption in Russia. He's been arrested more than a dozen times and had his offices raided by police. Last year, while in prison, he was taken to hospital with a suspected case of poisoning. Russian-Canadian opposition activist Peter Verzalov says he was the victim of an apparent poisoning in 2018 and that his symptoms are similar to what's being reported about Navalny. I started losing my eyesight, my coordination, my ability to walk. He says if Navalny's condition doesn't improve, there will be outrage from his millions of supporters. People will definitely take to the streets and will definitely uh, demand justice and demand uh, the government to do everything that is possible to at least find uh, the pe people who have organized this operation. At this point, there is no official confirmation he was poisoned. But if it turns out to be the case, it will again throw the spotlight on other attacks of high-profile critics of Russia. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Let's turn now to Canada's fight against COVID-19. The country marked 383 new cases today, most in Alberta, 103, 86 in Quebec and 80 in British Columbia. 76 new infections were registered in Ontario, though some of its health units say a glitch prevented them from reporting figures. Canada has nearly 4,500 active cases. CBC News has learned that manufacturing giant 3M will start making N95 respirators in Ontario. Ottawa, the province, and the company will split the $70 million cost of expanding 3M's Brockville facility. The goal is to start production by next year. Canada has no domestic supply of these critical masks. Ottawa has spent billions during this pandemic under much public scrutiny, but CBC News has learned details about one little publicized program, renting hotel rooms to help certain travelers quarantine. Tara Carmen explains. After spending 10 years in Peru, when COVID-19 hit, Jeff Govro knew he needed to get home. 
In early April, he landed at Toronto's Pearson Airport, unsure where he could safely spend his first two weeks. My father's nearly 90 years old and my brother was a medical professional, so I couldn't stay there. He says quarantine officers whisked him by private shuttle to a hotel 10 minutes away. A nurse showed him up to his room and that's where he stayed for 14 days. There was one person that was kind of going stir crazy down the hall. He wasn't taking it too well uh, going in quarantine. Govro says he was given three meals a day, twice daily health checkups, all paid for by the federal government. CBC News has learned Govro is in fact one of more than 3,000 people Ottawa has put up across the country since the pandemic hit, paying a tab that by the end of July had already topped $37 million. According to the Public Health Agency of Canada, there are 11 designated hotel quarantine sites across the country. Ottawa won't say which hotels for privacy reasons. Earlier this week, more than 250 people were being quarantined in rooms scattered across the country at Ottawa's expense. Hey guys, this is Vijay. Vijay Alawadi was put up in a room after arriving in Canada as a permanent resident from India. Yes, guys, it's really good. The food is really good. He took video of his stay and knows it may raise questions for some about why taxpayers are on the hook. I will be paying taxes to the government. End of the day, everyone will pay taxes to the government. It's not known how much was budgeted or if there's a hard end date. But as long as the 14-day quarantine law is in place for arrivals, the government is still offering help for those in a bind. Though it's stressing, the hotel rooms are only a last resort for people who truly have no other options. Tara Carmen, CBC News, Vancouver. A promising new test being developed for COVID-19 doesn't require a long probe up your nose. It looks to be simpler and quicker, even if it's not yet available here. Christine Birak explains. It's being called groundbreaking, a saliva test for COVID-19. No swabs required. Instead, it can detect the virus in a tube of spit. Funded in part by the NBA, Saliva Direct has been granted emergency use authorization by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. The results aren't instant. They still take 24 hours. But those rapid tests could be the key to making schools and workplaces safer. In the United States, access to those saliva tests is still limited. But here in Canada, they're not available at all. Health Canada says an American company has submitted an application to review its saliva test. It hasn't been accepted yet, but the agency says it's working on it as quickly as possible. You know, we've just broken down some of these barriers. Yale researchers who've developed this latest saliva testing method say their results rival other proven tests and it's cheaper. But the spit still needs to be sent to a lab. I think this is just that stepping stone that's going to help us get into this realm of, you know, of the faster tests, of the at-home tests. One of those at-home tests may come from the University of Victoria. The idea is to get this done in, uh, in 15, 20 minutes. Chemist Alex Brolo developed a quick pregnancy-type test for Zika virus. Now for COVID-19, the strip changes color if it detects the coronavirus in a spit sample. And we hope to get the saliva proof of concept by the end, by the end of the summer. Then in the fall, it's going to be validation and, and, and approval. Well, I think it's really exciting. Infectious disease experts are now eager to hear from Health Canada. Once tests have been approved by Health Canada, um, provinces have been able to scale up testing pretty rapidly. All tests have limitations, but a safe, effective saliva test can't come fast enough. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Thousands of Yukon students headed back to school today. They're some of the first in Canada to start the new school year in this pandemic. Among the changes some schools have made, desks set at a distance from each other, plastic bins replacing lockers to keep hallways clear, and in one school, clear shower curtains acting as dividers. Yukon currently does not have any active COVID cases. The Toronto District School Board approved some major changes to its back-to-school plan today. Class sizes will be reduced in areas that have a heightened risk of COVID-19. More than 300 additional teachers are being hired. All students and staff will need to wear a face covering. And the school year will likely be delayed until September 15th with a staggered start. Thousands of Californians are out of their homes, fleeing fast-growing wildfires 
that have already killed two people. Up next, battling thick smoke, a grueling heat wave, and a pandemic. Plus, just a few days until the Conservative Party has a new leader, what voters in key ridings are looking for. We need to encompass what all Canadians feel socially. Plus, a slur over a hot mic gets an MLB commentator tossed out. I made a comment earlier tonight that uh, I guess uh, went out over the air. We hear from those trying to change the game. We're back in two. Welcome back. A new study says Greenland lost a record amount of ice last year. More than 530 billion metric tons melted off the frozen island. That's a million tons a minute. More than twice the annual average since 2003. Nearly half was lost in July during an unusual heat wave. A large wildfire in British Columbia's Okanagan has grown to an estimated 20 square kilometers. Wind, rocky terrain and heavy smoke are making it harder for firefighters. More than 300 properties have already been evacuated and thousands of people are on alert. And California finds itself in the midst of two crises, raging wildfires amid the global pandemic. Thousands have been forced from the safety of their homes as fast-moving flames rip through the communities. A grueling heat wave making things worse, challenging the resource-strapped state. Nearly 370 fires are burning, with the largest and the most concerning being two clusters in Northern California, which have already torched more than 1,000 square kilometers. As Briar Stewart shows us, the dueling crises have officials on the ground scrambling. Even in a state that routinely sees dangerous, even deadly wildfires, the scale of what's happening now is being called unprecedented. And I follow. Hundreds are burning across California, ignited by lightning strikes as the state endures a stifling heat wave. Thousands have been ordered to leave. Time to go. It was too hot to drive and then, God save me, I, I, I don't think I would have made it. But a few have stayed trying to protect their homes with whatever they have, hoping for the best. This morning they came in about 4 o'clock and said it's time to go, time to go, so uh, we're just going to see what happens. A helicopter pilot died along with a utility worker who was helping first responders. In California's wine country, more than 100 homes have been destroyed. Local fire crews warn of being overwhelmed. This is a very large fire. It's one of many in the state of California. And honestly, our resources are stretched very far. California has asked for help from other states. Normally, more than 10,000 prison inmates are on hand to help fire crews, but this year, less than half are available because of COVID-19 and quarantine orders. What we're trying to do is work with local hotels. to get The pandemic is also rooms, affecting so how evacuation centers are being managed. We know we can't put 500 people into a high school gymnasium, so we have to make sure that we're going through what the CDC tells us. Even those not in the fire's path have been suffering through extreme heat and power blackouts. All the smoke has led to air quality warnings throughout much of the state, and crews battling the fires won't get much help from the weather because more hot and dry conditions are expected in the days ahead. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. After a busy week in politics, the action keeps going this weekend. The Conservatives are choosing a new leader. We need to keep social Conservatives in the conversation, but we need to encompass what all Canadians feel socially. Next, who's shaking up the race? Plus, this is a perfect night for ad issue. Rosie and the crew on the new finance minister proroguing parliament and the race to lead the official opposition. The Conservative leadership race is winding down. Mail-in votes are due tomorrow, and the winner will be announced on Sunday. There are four names on the ballot, including a political newcomer, but she's really got the party talking. Regardless of whether Leslyn Lewis wins, the excitement about her candidacy has shaken up the race. As Catherine Cullen explains, the future of the party could hinge on her success. 
They may be the clear front runners, but a political rookie has raised some interesting questions about where the Conservative Party is going. We are the party that believes in equality of outcome. Leslin Lewis has proved popular with peers. Well, I don't think we're going to be arguing too much here, Leslin. I agree with you, Dr. Lewis. I Mr. very Kent. much associate with what Dr. Lewis has said. Better, stronger Canada. And raised a surprising $1.8 million from party members. Generally speaking, I mean, she's not what you expect from a conservative politician. Conservative strategist Shakir Chambers says that's in part because she's a black woman, but also because of her approach to politics. I think the, the, one of the strengths of her is that she's very authentic. Uh, she didn't come into this race trying to be somebody she was not. <laughs> and if the party hopes to grow, it does have to challenge some people's impressions, says this pollster. For those who don't vote conservative, the party, I think, struggles. It's seen as old, traditional, closed-minded. Some even described it as, as racist. The Conservatives did get more votes than the Liberals in the last election, but to get the support needed to win, they need to reach out to new audiences, he says. The challenge still is, particularly on a generational level, that the party hasn't really, I think, tried to appeal to the next generation of voters. Then there are the questions about social issues that dogged the last leader. How has your opinion of gay marriage evolved? Do you feel that same-sex marriage is just as morally equivalent as traditional marriage. Can you point to a single policy in your platform uh, that you believe shows uh, that you do support women's rights? It created some heated debate in the party about whether socially conservative views have held the conservatives back or whether it was simply how Andrew Scheer handled the questions. Social conservatism is a very, very important part of our party. Lewis wants to limit access to abortion and medical aid in dying. But she's still won respect from some who criticize Scheer's handling of social issues. The Conservative Party includes uh, social conservatives. There's no denying that. And to have a leader who can communicate about it thoughtfully uh, is something that, uh, that, that, is better, that, that makes the party, frankly, better off. It's highly unlikely Lewis will become the next leader. But questions around modernizing the party and the role of social conservatives are waiting for the winner. There's a huge opportunity here for whoever is the, uh, the next Conservative leader, and that's to talk about a vision, a new direction for Canada. Because uh, it doesn't look like the Liberals are doing all that well, and this provides an opportunity for a pedestal to do better. And the pressure will be enormous because what the vast majority of Conservatives really want, most of all, is for the next leader to defeat Justin Trudeau. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. The Ontario riding of Milton was a Conservative stronghold until last year. So party members say they know what's at stake with the choice of a new leader, someone who can get the riding back into the fold. Jamie Strachan explains. Thank you very much. With days to go before the federal Conservatives choose their new leader, Kadir Shah is working to get out the vote. Two ballots. Thank you very much. He's crisscrossing Milton, a Toronto suburb with a small town feel a riding the Conservatives held for years before the Liberals defeated high-profile Conservative star Lisa Raitt in the last election. The 2020 Conservative leadership election. The future of Canada. Less than a year later, local Conservatives are focused on the four-way race to pick a new party leader. We need to keep social Conservatives in the conversation, but we need to encompass what all Canadians feel socially. This youth organizer promises to put his energy behind whoever wins. We need someone who will lay out real comprehensive policy months before the election so we can tell people what our party and the soul and the fabric of Conservatives are really about. I think it starts at the top. Lifelong Milton resident Nicole Chuchmack is a new party member helping choose a leader for the first time. She's supporting political outsider Leslyn Lewis. She didn't know French and she learned French within uh, five weeks and in a French debate. And I think that speaks volumes about her work ethic. Not once have I thought to myself, oh, I wish I was back in Ottawa. Lisa Raitt is now in the private sector, but still very involved. She helped moderate the leadership debates. Ray says the last election demonstrated the need for flexible thinking at the top. We have to make sure that we take to heart what comments we're getting back and we feed them up the food chain so that the leader can pivot if there's something happening on the ground.
She also says the winner has to present a conservative vision palatable to most Canadians. The translation of conservative values to the general populace is a really important, a really important skill that the next leader is going to have to have. That next leader will be revealed Sunday when all those ballots are counted. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Milton, Ontario. And we have special coverage of the leadership race this weekend, including a conservative strategy panel tomorrow night on The National. And on Sunday, Chief Political Correspondent Rosie Barton will host full coverage starting at 5 p.m. Eastern, followed by more special coverage on The National. Okay, with all that coming up this weekend, and after a wild week in Ottawa, it is the perfect night for that issue. Adrian, it was the Prime Minister's first week back from vacation and turns out it was a busy one. From a resignation to a cabinet shuffle, proroguing Parliament and now a looming confidence vote, we'll break it all down with Chantal, Andrew and Althea after this. We have a choice to make. We can decide to move forward instead of returning to the status quo. We can choose to embrace bold new solutions to the challenges we face and refuse to be held back by old ways of thinking. As much as this pandemic is an unexpected challenge, it is also an unprecedented opportunity. Some of the messaging we can expect to hear more of in next month's throne speech as the government presses reset and outlines its priorities for a post-pandemic recovery. But will it be enough to gain the confidence of the House? Was proroguing Parliament the right move? It's Thursday, so we had to call back at issue after this very busy week. Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj. It's almost like, I feel like Monday was like two weeks ago when we last talked and Bill Morneau uh, had quit. But lots has happened since Monday. Let, let's, let's start with the prorogation, the decision to shut down Parliament until September 23rd. Althea, I'm going to start with you. Was this politics or was this a legitimate uh, move to reset? Was it both? Um, I think there is a need to reset from the government's point of view, but this was absolutely about politics. There is no reason they could not have prorogued the House on September 22nd and allow the committees to continue their work. And frankly, the legislation they introduced on Thursday today, uh, extending CERB and mostly making changes to the EI system, they could have introduced those this month in mm -hmm. August. And instead, basically, millions of Canadians are being held hostages possibly on this idea of a confidence vote that the Liberals may be possibly trying to engineer their own defeat. You know, the other kind of curveball in this is that we are in the COVID-19 pandemic and the Liberals and the Conservatives and the NDP and the Bloc have agreed to a specific number of MPs in the chamber. Now, does that agreement hold? Do the Liberals send in more people? Do they send in fewer mm. people? Mm. Do the opposition send in fewer people? The numbers game could be a very interesting curveball that would normally not be the case if it wasn't a pandemic. How, how should we view the prorogation, Andrew? How should regular Canadians see that and, and what should they make of it? Well, there's, the first point is there's nothing wrong with prorogation in principle. So right. Sometimes it's presented as if it's a dirty trick on, on its own, but the context matters. As Althea said, if it was just a matter of, of a reset, quote unquote, or presenting a new agenda, and it's true that a lot has changed since the last throne speech, and it would be in order, but it's absolutely it could be the case that you could uh, prorogue on September the 22nd and come back on September the 23rd. The reason why this is month delay is to shut down these four committees that are looking into the ever metastasizing uh, WE scandal, uh, and that makes them look a lot like the government they replaced. It's, this is not quite as bad as the first prorogation that Stephen Harper did, which was the to get out of a confidence vote that he was likely to lose. But it looks a whole lot like the second one, which was to shut down another parliamentary investigation, that one into the Afghan detainee controversy. And this was the government that came in saying, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to play those kinds of, tr of tricks with it. So once again, we're seeing this government, um, you know, new boss, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Well, what does that tell us, Chantal, about the prime minister and, and if anything, about how he has evolved or, or maybe this was always the way? I don't know. It tells us that the, the liberals uh, are willing to fight an election in the fall if they need to. I don't believe they will need to. Uh, what this move accomplished it. Uh, the, the we suspension, true enough, they could have not done it. 
I would argue that uh, if this story really has legs, it's going to come back with a vengeance. That is exactly what happened with the sponsorship issue, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. with Parliament prorogued and then Paul Martin coming back, and, and it only uh, remained as a cloud that eventually drowned out uh, his government's efforts on every other front. So, uh, yes, uh, there's politics involved. But what uh, Justin Trudeau has also done, uh, and it was within his purview, I'm not sure that I totally disagree with the notion that he changed the terms of engagement. You had the Bloc Québécois saying, we can't wait to come back to the House of Commons to put in a non-confidence motion on ethics, and the government could fall and we're ready to go in an election, albeit mm -hmm. we don't want one. Mm -hmm. The answer is, well, if you want an election, you can have one, but it's going to be on what you want to have as a policy going yeah, forward. Right. Okay, I, 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 we have so much to talk about, but little time, and I want to make sure we at least address the conservative leadership race once before we get to Sunday, and you will all be back on Sunday. But do you think that the events of this week, this past week, change anything in terms of the dynamics or the, the pressure or the focus for the new leader, whoever that is, out, out of the four candidates? It is, is it now a more important moment for the conservative party, Althea? The new leader has to be thinking about the next election on Monday. Uh, is really what it comes down to. It is too late in the game to change the calculus in your mind. If you were trying to send a signal to the party uh, with your choice as a leader to change your ballot, basically the ballots have to be in by five o'clock. I think it is tomorrow. At least tomorrow is the deadline. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really too late to make an to have an impact on the race. But it does change. I think it crystallizes for the new leader. Uh, the fact that they have to go heavy on candidate recruitment, they need to decide what the party plans to talk about. There will maybe not be a policy convention before we have another election. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it basically, frankly, gives a lot of cards to the new leader. It gives a lot of cards, but that, that seems to be a lot of pressure too, <laughs> Andrew, to have to come up with new ideas, perhaps on a timeline that you maybe weren't expecting. Well, absolutely. This is a party that has both historically and in recent history has had trouble defining itself. It has trouble standing up for what it believes after it has defined it. Uh, and none of these leaders are particularly uh, going to uh, light the house on fire in terms of bringing in uh, new thoughts about where we're going, in particular in the, in, in the economy. The yeah. liberals are signaling they are going to take a major turn to the left. Uh, what is going to be the conservative response to that? They have very little time and not a great track record. Yeah, and we, we already saw the Prime Minister sort of speaking about that the other day, Chantal, when he talked about other parties will want to, you know, restrain, you know, funding and they'll want to make cuts. And, and obviously, as, as Andrew said, the, the Liberals are preparing to turn on the taps here. Well, uh, even today's announcement on yeah. SORB and going forward on EI, I can't even imagine how the NDP could want to defeat the government yeah. on yeah. issues like that. So... If anyone who wins on Sunday believes that prosecuting Justin Trudeau and his government is going to do the trick, that person, hopefully for the conservative, would not be their leader. <laughs> because when the election comes, it's going to be about the way forward. There, the circumstances are too uh, radically different from anything we've known to believe that you can win an election just by having the government defeat itself. It's going to be a lot more complicated than that. In, in an environment uh, pandemically related that we don't really know all that much about yet. And is there someone better suited, Andrew, to, to not be just prosecuting <coughs> the Liberals and the government, but actually to be advancing an agenda that would make sense post-pandemic or, or into the next phase of it? Uh, do you like how I did that? Do you like how I did that? Not in this race. <laughs> I was going to say Mark Kearney. Uh, but the, 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 that's the trouble is, and I just, I guess I'll go back and say I think uh, Stephen Harper is to partly to blame for this, for not recruiting uh, and, 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 and promoting people so that you have a richer field of candidates when the time came. So you're stuck with the people who are running now, and, and uh, that's partly a, also a statement about where the party is. They, they have not wrapped their minds around a lot of the major issues, even before the pandemic, that mm -hmm. was facing us. Uh, and they need to do some of that heavy thinking. Chantal, and then quickly, Althea. Yeah, Chantal. Uh, I think uh, either Aaron O'Toole or Peter McKay would be able, and there's enough bench strength and intellectual strength left in the Conservative Party for either of them to 
get down to presenting the country with an alternative vision that would make sense. I'm not sure that that's the advice that either of them would be getting. Yeah. But uh, I am mindful that every time that a, a leader has been elected to the alternative party, uh, everyone has said, well, whoever's running is not up to the job. Mm -hmm. uh, last word so, to you, Althea, on that. Most of them weren't. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I feel like you're kind of asking us to, to say who we think should yes, be I the am. leader. Yes, <laughs> I am. And I, we're I, not I, going to. Uh, <laughs> I would just say I think there's going to be a lot of pressure with regards to the U.S. election as well. And the more, mm -hmm. like, let's not forget there's going to be at least two confidence votes, right? There's a vote on the speech from the throne, and then there will be a vote on the budget. So even if right. they survive speech from the throne, the opposition has the opportunity to veto them on the budget. And the way things are going, I'm sure Justin Trudeau would much rather run an election with, you know, Donald Trump still in office than he would with Joe mm -hmm. Biden. I, I tried my best, but you were all too wily for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all, and I will see you all back here on Sunday for the leadership results, and then later on the National uh, that night. Thank you all. Appreciate it very much. And now let's go back to Adrian in Toronto. All right. Next up, a broadcaster gets the boot after saying a homophobic slur on the air. I always think of that, you know, 12, 13, 14 year old kid who's hearing this. Next, how advocates are working to change the game. Welcome back. A longtime broadcaster for the Cincinnati Reds baseball team has been suspended after he used a homophobic slur live on air yesterday. Devin Haru has the story. It all starts just before the top of the seventh inning, the first game of a doubleheader. Out of commercial, here's what the audience heard. One of the f capitals of the world. And then he didn't miss a beat. Reds live. Confirmation Tom Brenneman didn't know his mic was on came in the fifth inning of the second game when he addressed it. I made a comment earlier tonight that uh, I guess uh, went out over the year that I am deeply ashamed of. He went on for more than a minute. As there's a drive in a deep left field. By Even calling a home run as he apologized. I am very, very sorry and I beg for your forgiveness. The next inning, he was gone. Reaction was swift. The team said it was devastated by the horrific homophobic remark made this evening and was truly sorry to anyone who has been offended. Reds pitcher Amir Garrett tweeted to the LGBTQ community, just know I am with you and whoever is against you is against me. Look, cultural change is hard and we never assumed that uh, everybody was going to stop using slurs or be completely tolerant and or accepting. At You Can Play, we believe that sports are for everybody. You Can Play has spent the last decade trying to educate athletes, coaches, and thousands more involved in sports about the power of words and the weight homophobic slurs carry. You know, I always think of that, you know, 12, 13, 14-year-old kid who's hearing this and somehow thinks that he or she is less than and not accepted in sports uh, because of, you know, what you hear from athletes or broadcasters. Brenneman has been suspended. The Reds say news about their broadcasting crew will come in the next few days. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. Next on The National, our moment. She's the first from her small First Nation to win a basketball scholarship. She wants to make sure she is not the last. Growing up, Emily Mandamon dreamt of being able to play basketball in front of a big crowd. Now she is writing a full scholarship to the States to do just that. Mandamon is from a small First Nation in northwestern Ontario. And she's the first from her community of around 300 people to get a basketball scholarship. And this is our moment tonight. Wow, it was like insane, like breathtaking. I've always, every single time, ever since I was younger, I'd always dream about getting to go play college basketball in front of a huge crowd and just being able to go to school for free. Uh, I got into basketball just because it was a really low income sport. Um, it was really easy and accessible. There was a court probably about like a two minute walk from my house. This is the thing I've worked for. This is what all the late nights, early mornings are for. It's just everything I've dreamt of and more. Um, the support, the love and everything I've had is 
amazing. Like there's nothing like it. I really want to become a social worker and I just want to learn about how the world works and how people work because I really want to start start my own charity and my own foundation so I can um so I can sponsor kids to go to university, play athletics, do sports, things like that. It's just just kind of helping out wherever I could because growing up I always had to ask for help and ask for financial donations. So I want to be that person to help these kids out if they feel like they don't have anywhere to go, they could always come to me. Okay, well, uh, Emily, you have a huge future on and especially off the court. Um, already, Emily is in Illinois. Be classes start very soon. Uh, games don't start until January, so be careful. Have fun. That is a national for Thursday, August 20th.